for today's video we're going to take a look at an agaphone, also known as an agaphon, wire recorder made in Sweden in the late 40s or early 1950s. Wire recorders were the first form of magnetic recording device, and although it was invented right at the end of the 1800s, they didn't really become available to the public until the late 1940s. Then the format itself only lasted until somewhere in the mid-1950s, when the more familiar magnetic tape took over. I'd heard of wire recorders, and I always imagined that the wire would be quite thick, maybe like this reel of solder here. My solder is 0.7 of a millimetre in diameter, and it wasn't until I saw Techmoan's video about his Webster Chicago wire recorder, and if you haven't seen that video, it's a really good video and you should check it out. Anyway, it was then that I discovered how incredibly fine the wire is. Uh, it actually mics up at 0.08 of a millimetre, so that's about a tenth of the size of my solder, and it's incredibly delicate. I already had a collection of vintage dictation machines, and it seemed only natural that at some point in time I'd end up with a wire recorder. So when this one popped up on eBay for a reasonable price, I jumped at the chance. I was a bit alarmed when the delivery driver arrived with an armful of bits. The machine had been packed in one of those plastic boxes for a circular saw or similar, and it had been simply taped up at the bottom with a teeny bit of gaffer tape, which had obviously split and the machine had come crashing out. The uh, outer wooden box had got damaged and split on this corner. I'll have a look at repairing that a bit later. Um, the actual protector for the stop button here is cracked. I'll probably leave that for the moment. And probably most significantly, the neon for the recording circuit was smashed. The wooden carry box is definitely worth restoring. It's got a place to store the microphone and its cable, and it's got the original dealer's label on the inside. Luckily, the rest of the machine had more or less survived, and it actually worked. But the broken neon was a bit of an issue. It's needed for the recording circuit to work properly, and it's an old GE NE51 neon, but this is a discontinued part, and I could only find new old stock in America, and the shipping costs were ridiculous. Anyway, after a bit more research, I managed to track down a modern equivalent, a B1A neon, and I got one of those from a UK seller, and that's what's installed here. The microphone itself is fairly damaged. It's quite nice. It says AGA on the top for Agaphone. Uh, but it's fairly cracked on the side. It was like that on the listing on eBay, and it's got an old repair here that hasn't really worked. It may have got a little bit more cracked when it got dropped in transit, but anyway, that'll need looking at. It's a hard old plastic. It's not ABS or anything, so I can't use ABS weld, but I might have a look at that later in the video and see if there's anything I can do with it. Fixing the broken wooden carry case should be pretty easy. I'll just open out the crack, like so, if I can, there we go, and stick a little wedge in so it stays open for a minute, and I'll get some wood glue into the gap, just all the way down, and then just work that in with a little bit of plastic so I can coat both sides of the actual split on the inside. Okay, that should do. Give it a quick clean off. And now I'll clamp it together when I find the clamps, which are somewhere over here. So bear with. So I'll stick one down there. And another one, something like. that. And again, wipe off any excess glue, leave that to set, and that'll be job done. Looking round the machine, you've got a loudspeaker on the front with the AGA logo at the bottom. Beneath that, you've got the large stop switch. 
Next to that we've got this row of buttons and you've got the listen or play button and while that's down if you press the repeat button it's like a review button so it'll rewind until you let go and then it'll carry on playing. Next to the repeat button is the reverse button or normal rewind. This one will latch in place until either you press the stop button or until the counter here gets back to zero and then it'll stop rewinding. Next along is the signal button. This, as far as I'm aware, is meant to put a tone through the speaker. I'm not sure whether that's on record or playback, but it doesn't actually work. And it's possible that this is due to the replacement neon, which might not be quite the right spec, uh, because the neon is in the circuit that creates the tone. And anyway, next to that we've got the dictate or record button. Above those we've got the two rotary dials here and here. The one on the left is the counter and that is marked in approximate seconds so when it gets back to the top it's done a minute and you'll see the window at the bottom will clock up to one minute and so on two minutes and three minutes. And when you want to reset this you wind it back to the zero position there and then push it in and that will engage the counter. You pull it out to adjust it. On the right is the volume knob. This also has the on off switch so when it's at zero the machine is switched off and you'll hear it click as I turn it on. And then the rest of it is just normal playback volume. But it also doubles up as the recording level adjustment as well. And the neon works as a peak recording indicator, so when you're getting to peak recording level and you're likely to distort, the neon lights up a little bit. On the left hand side of the machine, there's a socket for headphones and a foot switch that you'd use if you were transcribing a dictation. And on the right hand side is the socket for the microphone and its built in remote switch. And you can see the microphone itself is colour coded with red and white dots to correspond with the markings here. So we'll put the red at the top and plug that in. The microphone itself has the remote switch on the top which if you press that in and push it backwards it latches in place to put the machine into play mode or record mode depending on which button is pressed on the front of the unit. Looking at the back there's just the power cord and some cooling vents. And then on the underside there's a machine specification plate along with a voltage selector switch here. There's one other sticker on the bottom which according to Google Translate says something like approved for power connection. The wire reels for the Agaphone come with a carrying caddy like this which has these spring loaded clips that keep the wire reel in place so it doesn't come unspooled when you, it's not on the machine. And when these are fitted onto the machine, these press upwards like that, releasing the spool. I've got two sets of reels for my Agaphone, so I'll just quickly swap over to the other set to show you how it's done. There's a little weighted section here that holds the wire down onto the recording head, and that lifts off like that. I haven't got a full set of the spring-loaded clips for this second caddy, so I haven't got either of them fitted, I've only got one. So this pulls off fairly simply like this, and moves out of the way. And you can see on the centre hub here, there's a little ball bearing, and that's what holds the spool on when it's fitted to the machine. So I'll bring in the second caddy, and place it over the hubs, and press down and you'll see how now both of these spring clips have popped up releasing the um, spools so they can turn. On the bottom of the caddy plate you can see there is a printed line showing you which way round the wire should cross the caddy and cross the playhead. And in the bottom of the playhead itself there is a channel or groove and in the bottom of that is the actual head that does the playing and recording. And then the little weighted section that sits on top of that has a V in it that guides the wire down into the bottom of that groove to keep it in contact with the playhead, like that. 
Another little feature of the caddy system for the wire reels is this channel on the front. You can get a bit of card or paper and write details of whatever it is you've got recorded on your wire, like that. Each pair of reels that came with my Agaphone have enough wire on them to do one hour of recording. If you can manage to do that one hour without the wire breaking, which seems pretty unlikely. All in all, the machine, complete with the recording wire, microphone and its wooden case, weighs in at a fairly hefty 11.5 kilograms, so it's not exactly lightweight. So now, having looked round the machine and had a look at the controls, I think it's about time to see what it sounds like. Both of the wire reels are full of recordings, and there's stuff like a couple of episodes of The Goons Show recorded off the radio, and then there's music from The Rolling Stones, The Beatles and Jimi Hendrix, all of which is copyright so I can't play you any of that. But there are a few other bits that have been recorded on top of those recordings, so we'll have a listen to one of those now. And so there you have a bit of a recording made, probably sometime in the 1950s. Well, this video wouldn't be complete if it didn't feature at least one broken recording wire. I was just setting up to do a bit of recording on the machine and the wire broke. So I shall repair that now before we can carry on. So I'll get it re-spooled carefully back onto the reel, or the reels. Uh, uh, this one's in a right state, which is what always happens. Um, Yes, I think I might pause the camera for a minute while I do this. OK, that's the wire joined back together. In essence, what you have to do is knot the broken bit back together and cut off any loose ends. But what tends to happen, once you've got a break, that'll snag next time you play it and it'll break somewhere else. And these wires have previously been broken many times, so they tend to break every time you get to one of the knots now. Um, so yeah, it'd be nice to get some new reels. Maybe if I see some at a good price, I'll buy some in the future. Right, after that slight pause in proceedings, I think we can get on with some recording. So I'll press the dictate button to put it into standby, and then when I press the button on the microphone, it'll start recording. It's no surprise that magnetic tape replaced wire recorders pretty quickly. Regardless of the audio quality, the re wire recorders were so fussy. When, and not if, the wire breaks, it's quite springy and it tends to partially unwind and get tangled really easily. And if you should happen to drop one of the reels, well then you'll be in real trouble. OK. We'll now stop that and we'll rewind the tape and see what it sounds like. To actually rewind the tape I have to press the button on the microphone again because when the microphone's plugged in it has to have the button pressed for the machine to do anything. So we'll get that pressed and locked into place and now we'll hit the rewind or reverse button which will rewind the wire until it gets back to the zero marker. like that. Now I'll just reduce the volume a bit because I've got it set for the recording level and let's play that and see what it sounds like. It's no surprise that magnetic tape replaced wire recorders pretty quickly. Regardless of the audio quality, the re wire recorders were so fussy. When, and not if, the wire breaks, it's quite springy and it tends to partially unwind and get tangled really easily. And 
and as you can see it records pretty well for a machine that's what about 70 years old or something like that uh, the other thing I could show right now is the repeat button which is kind of like a review so if I put it on play and then hold the repeat it'll just rewind till I re release repeat again so put it on to play just like that. So now, as is traditional on these videos, we'll try a bit of music on the machine. So, I've already got the button locked down on the microphone, so it's ready to record as soon as I press the record button. And I've got some music ready to play, so let's hit the record button and then crank up the music. Okay, we'll stop that and then rewind it and see how good it sounds. So we'll press rewind and wait for it to rewind back to the zero position. And press play and see what we get. And there you have it. It's not entirely great, but it's not that bad for something that's around 70 years old. You'll notice that the playhead moves up and down as the machine is playing or rewinding. That ensures that the wire is evenly wound on the spools. And I'm sure you'll all be dying to see what's on the inside, so let's take the bottom off and have a look and see what's inside. Looks like there's six screws holding the bottom in place, so I'll see if I can get those out without getting in the way of the camera, which might be tricky, but we'll see. Okay, now let's free off the bottom panel. One moment, please. Uh -huh, there she blows. Okay, let's have a little look. Okay, what have we got? We've got a couple of valves here for the amplification circuit. The drive motor is here. And looking at the drive for the counter, the shaft here is on a worm drive from the actual spools themselves. And that turns the gear here. And then at the back, this section deals with counting the minutes. So for each revolution of the gear here, this will move on one segment. Like that. 
the transformer is here behind this plate and you've got a smoothing capacitor here and a fuse here. You probably can't make it out but the back of the loudspeaker is just in here. And I've just plucked out one of the two valves here which is a Mallard ECC33. The other valve has got a built-in heat shield or shroud of some form, so I'll leave that one in place. I suspect the valves are a little bit tired because as the unit gets warm the sound quality deteriorates somewhat. And finally let's take a little look at this broken microphone. As you can see it's just coming apart all over the place now. So I think we'll get it undone and see what we can do to make it a little bit better. It'll never be perfect but we'll see what we can do with it and this is a sort of sleeved screw which is spinning but no we, I think we're almost there now. Okay yeah one sort of self-destructing disintegrating microphone case. It's a really hard old plastic so I'll have a little look see what I can do with that. Okay for the microphone repair I've ground myself some grooves on the inside using a cutting disc in my Dremel and then I'm going to glue it together with epoxy resin and insert these metal pins to reinforce the repair a bit like reinforced concrete. Right, here's the broken half of the microphone with the pins bonded in place. You can still see the cracks on the other side, I'm not too worried about that. I could fill them and colour them in but it'll be fine. And finally here's the microphone back together. The cracks are still visible but the main thing is it doesn't fall apart in my hands when I use it. So I think that is job done. I think that's about it for this video. If you've enjoyed watching, feel free to like the video and subscribe to the channel. There'll be more vintage stuff and repairs coming soon. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you in a future video.